I now, first of all, give the floor to Mr. Yang Kubish. Mr. President, uh, Excellencies, distinguished members of the Security Council, over the course of the over the course of the last month's positive developments have renewed hope for the reunification of the country and its institutions, for the restoration of its sovereignty, for sustainable peace, development, security, and stability in Libya and the region. A critical task of Libyan authorities and institutions remains to ensure the holding of parliamentary and presidential elections on the 24th of December, as set out in the LPDF roadmap and called for by the Security Council Resolution 2570. This priority lies at the core of the mandate of the Government of National Unity. The House of Representatives has the responsibility to clarify the constitutional basis for elections and adopt the necessary electoral legislation. This must be done latest by the 1st of July to allow Libya's High National Elections Commission, HNEC, adequate time to prepare for the elections. ANSMIL facilitated the work of the legal committee of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, LPDF, that developed a proposal for the constitutional basis. The LPDF will discuss it at its plenary meeting, which is scheduled for the 26th and 27th of May, with a focus on resolving the remaining open issues and forwarding the proposed constitutional basis to the House of Representatives and High Council of State. Following our meeting, the Speaker of the House, in his statement on the 4th of May, confirmed the importance of holding the presidential Brian, could we please pause as the reception is... Uh... Or three. 
And we can go ahead now. So I will uh, continue uh, with the second paragraph. Ansmil facilitated the work of the legal committee of the LPDF that developed a proposal for the constitutional basis. The LPDF will discuss at its plenary, which is scheduled for the 26th and 27th of May, with a focus on resolving the remaining open issues and forwarding the proposed constitutional basis to the House of Representatives, HOR, and High, High Council of State. Following our meeting, the Speaker of the House, in his statement of the 4th of May, confirmed the importance of holding the presidential and parliamentary elections on time. He noted that if the LPDF agrees, the agreement should be referred to the HOR to be adopted and added to the constitutional declaration. And if there is no agreement, then we, said the speaker, implement HOR resolution number five of 2014 to conduct direct presidential elections. A draft legislation on direct presidential elections is ready to be presented to the HOR, said the speaker. The High Election National Election Commission has been working consistently for the elections on the 24th of December. The voters list has been revised to be ready for an upcoming voter registration update and that the production of the 2.3 million voter cards for those voters who registered in previous electoral processes has already started. At the local level, the Central Committee for Municipal Council Elections aims to conclude 70-70 outstanding council elections this year, including in the Eastern but HNEC efforts will be futile if the electoral legislation is not adopted by HOR latest by the end of June to implement credible national elections. Mr. President, the ceasefire continues to hold. Notwithstanding occasional clashes between diverse armed groups, Confidence building between the two sides continues. In the past period, hundreds of prisoners and detainees were released by both sides, with releases taking place almost weekly in different parts of the country, particularly during the month of Ramadan. Yet, progress on key issues such as the reopening of the coastal road between Sirte and Misrata and the start of the withdrawal of foreign mercenaries, fighters and foreign forces has stalled, thus entrenching the division of Libya. The recent report of the UN panel of experts painted a bleak picture of months with arms embargo. Resolutions 2570 and 2571 found it necessary to again urge Libyan parties and all member states to respect and support the full implementation of the arms embargo and ceasefire agreement, including through the withdrawal of all foreign forces and mercenaries from Libya without delay. I'd like to acknowledge here an important role of Operation Irini. Article 2 of the ceasefire agreement stipulates that, and I quote, all military units and armed groups shall clear all confrontation lines and return to their camps. In parallel, all mercenaries and foreign fighters shall depart from the Libyan territories, land, air and sea, based, end of quotation. Based on this, pulling back a limited number of mercenaries and then flying them out can commence a reciprocal, balanced, 
and sequenced withdrawal of foreign mercenaries, fighters, and foreign forces. This approach, already adopted by the 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission, needs to be complemented by a plan and timelines agreed with those external forces that are associated with mercenaries and foreign forces in Libya. Resolution 2517 authorizes UNSWIL to deploy monitors in support of the Libyan-led and Libyan-owned ceasefire monitoring mechanism. For phase one, the Secretariat will deploy forward presence of a total 10 monitors from existing UN capacities of UN observers. Mr. President, the continued use, presence and activities of thousands of mercenaries, foreign fighters and armed groups is a significant threat, not just to Libya's security, but to the region as a whole. The recent disturbing events in Chad again remind us of the interrelated nature and links between the security situation in Libya and the security and stability of the region. The high mobility of armed groups and terrorists, but also economic migrants and refugees, often through channels operated by organized criminal networks and other local players across uncontrolled borders, only enhances risks of furthering instability and insecurity in Libya and the region. It is therefore critical to ensure an orderly departure of foreign fighters, mercenaries and armed groups, together with their disarmament, demobilization and reintegration in the countries of origin. Withdrawal of foreign fighters and armed groups with origins in the region must be accompanied by scaled up efforts across Libya and the wider region to address root causes of instability, notably through inclusive reconciliation, peace building and development programs with a focus on the youth, on women empowerment. Coordinated, complementary measures and programs supported and co-financed by the international community, coupled with resolute domestic and international action against criminal gangs of traffickers of people, drugs and weapons, and cooperative measures to enhance control in the border areas, including integrated border control and management, must be a part of the solution if it is to be durable and sustainable. It is equally critical to revisit the approach of Europe, the European Union, on the issue of refugees and migrants, working in partnership with Libya, the United Nations, and the African Union. The ceasefire agreement provides the Libyan-owned framework also to DDR. The JMC has been tasked to establish a DDR subcommittee to start identification and of armed groups and armed entities on the entire Libyan territory with a view to dismantling them and reintegrating their personnel in society or state service. The UN is committed to supporting the commencement of planning for DDR and security sector reform pursuant to a nationally owned and led strategy for DDR and SSR. Mr. President, the presidency on the 5th of April announced the establishment joint UNAU work is underway to support Libyan authorities on promoting right-based reconciliation and transitional justice with a focus on community and local level reconciliation and the meaningful participation of women, youth 
and all Libya's cultural components. The common thread running through all the human rights challenges in Libya is impunity, even for the most serious violations of international law. One of the most starkest reminders of the horrors of the Libyan conflict is the discovery of over 100 mass graves following the government of national accords recapture of Tarhuna. The rights of victims to truth, justice, reparation and return, full accountability for crimes is the only way to ensure justice and right-based reconciliation in Libya. Unless Libya addresses violations perpetrated by all sides in the cycles of conflict, then any effort towards sustainable peace will fail. Mr. President, the situation of migrants and refugees in Libya remains of grave concern. There are some 575,000 migrants from over 41 countries in Libya, with more than two-thirds coming from neighboring countries. More than 500 have died and 2,135 migrants and refugees have been returned to Libya by the Libyan Coast Guard so far in 2021, compared to 12,000 returned for all of 2020. Most of those returned are arbitrarily detained in extremely poor conditions by the Department of Combating Illegal Migration, with restricted or no access by humanitarian agencies or are transferred to non-state actors with thousands of people missing and unaccounted for in the official detention system. The government of national unity should swiftly put in place due process guarantees to end and prevent arbitrary detention through establishment of a judicial review system led by the Ministry of Justice, in line with its recent commitments to address arbitrary detention. Here I welcome a very positive response from Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Justice of Libya, both of them women. The government of national uni unity's active support to facilitate IO UNHCR humanitarian evacuation and voluntary return and resettlement of migrants and refugees from Libya is urgently needed in view of Libyan authorities' recent cancellation and postponement of such departures. I welcome renewed efforts to address the multifaceted migration and refugee issues in Libya through the revitalized tripartite, tripartite African Union, European Union, UN Task Force. Mr. President, as of early May, the total number of reported COVID-19 cases in Libya was 181,000, according to the WHO. The Government of National Unity's national vaccination program is underway in municipalities across the country. As of mid-May, about 100,000 people have received their first vaccine dose, with 731,000 people registered in the program. WHO and UNICEF continue to support national efforts to fight the pandemic, including with the arrival in Libya of the second batch of 117,000 vaccine doses through the COVAX facility on the 19th of May. Mr. President, it is up to the Libyan authorities and institutions to use the opportunities of the newly regained nascent unity and sovereignty in order to continue political position towards a unified, fully sovereign, peaceful and stable country with a full, effective and meaningful participation of women, the youth. The significant progress and achievements in the past many months must be consolidated. The processes must regain momentum. The authorities and institutions of Libya must live up to their responsibilities. 
all leaders and support the Presidential Council and Government of National Unity in their efforts to fully extend and effectively implement their authority and responsibilities throughout the whole Libya. Concerted and aligned efforts of the international community in support of Libya-led and owned processes remain critical. We need to continue working together with and providing meaningful support to Libyan authorities and institutions in their, in their efforts to achieve national reconciliation and transitional justice, the unification of state institutions, the full implementation of the ceasefire agreement, and to set the stage for holding the elections on the 24th of December for their free, fair and secure conduct and acceptance of their results. This is important for the Libyan people and for the region as a whole. Thank you for your attention. I thank Mr. Kubis for his briefing.